Uh, good morning once again, church. The reading text this morning will come from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 1 until 10. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. But you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not slaves to ex excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands, so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach, so that any opponent will be ashamed, because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Slaves are to submit to their, to their masters in everything, and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness, so that they may ad adorn the teaching of God, our yeah. Savior, in everything. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Today is a difficult sermon. It's difficult to preach. It's going to be difficult to hear. It's difficult to accept. It's difficult to digest. It's difficult to apply. And I want you to prepare your hearts. I want you to prepare your minds. I want you to prepare your ears to receive this very difficult word. I've been doing so this whole week as I've read this passage and as I've studied the scriptures. There will be good news, I promise, there always is. There's abundant grace. We are Gospel Center Church fam, so we'll get to the good news. If you're a believer, what I'm about to preach is a mirror to you. And you will have to do the work of applying it to you. I am going to teach it as it is. And then you will have to listen to the Holy Spirit's conviction. My prayer this morning is that you will once again experience the privilege of being called to this life. And that you'll experience the privilege of living a life of grace. When I'm done today, my hope is that you will respond with, wow, I get to do this. If you are here today and you don't believe in Jesus, I want you to know that you are very welcome. You will see a very, very clear picture of how Christians should live and what Christians are called to be in this world. It's going to be crystal clear to you this morning. You will also be able to decide if you want to be part of this. And you will be able to reflect on the lives of Christians you know to see if they are the real deal. That's what you'll be doing today or listening to. The good news part at the end, obviously, is specifically for you too. So let me pray for us, and then we'll dive in to this portion of Scripture. Lord Jesus, as we open up your word this morning, we are preparing our hearts and minds to hear from you. We know that it's going to be a difficult word, so we humble ourselves before you. We open up our lives to you. We ask you to shine your light on us, and we submit to you having your way in our lives. We just sung that, Lord Jesus. Make us your vessel. Make us an offering. We give all we are to you. Strengthen us. Encourage us, sanctify us, purify us, so that we can transform the culture in which you've placed us. We pray that in your name. Amen. I'm going to do a very, very long introduction. Warning. Then we're going to have two points, which is less than the three I usually have. 
And of the two points, the first point is really long and the second point short. Okay? I just want you to keep tracking with me. It's exactly like someone would say, we're driving down to Cape Town and these will be our stops on the way. Long intro. Let's go. This is my family. My wife's name is Marie. Our two daughters are called Ava and Katie. Ava is seven and Katie is five. Husband, wife, dad, mom, two kiddos. I am baptized and I also confess my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. My wife also confesses her faith in Jesus Christ. She's also baptized. Both of our kids are baptized. And I think if you press both of our kids now, they could actually give a really good account of what they believe. So Ava would be able to say the gospel and then also say that she believes in the gospel. So we, we can call her a believer. And KD at five years old always starts her prayers with, thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross and forgiving our sins. So that's kind of a good grasp of the gospel already at the age of five. She initially said, thank you for giving us sins. And we were like, no, 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 look, forgiving, forgiving, it's one word, not thank you for giving us sins, thank you for forgiving our sins. In Afrikaans, she prayed, dankie dat u ons sondes gegee het, and I'm like, no, 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 it's vergewe, that means forgiven. Now, in this picture, we look like any other family, right, I mean, there's parents and kids, but by our lives and conduct, you will see our allegiance to Jesus. Like if you look at us, apart from the picture, in our lives, you are supposed to see that we are a Jesus family. I'm going to use a sporting metaphor, but it's going to be neither rugby nor soccer. Let's go for cricket. Okay? I mean, we do live very close to Supersport Park, the home of the Momentum Multiply Titans. If you support the Momentum Multiply Titans, if you are really a fan, you will know them, you will attend the games at Supersport Park, you will rejoice when they win, you will lament when they lose, you will show your support when your support is called upon, you'll wear the jersey, you'll go to the games. True? Now let's say I say, that I'm a Momentum Multiply Titans fan, but I don't know a single person in the squad, I've never watched a game, I've never been at the stadium, I don't know the results as they came out, am I really a fan? Now in terms of sport, you'll say no. You'll say to me, I can see that you say that you are a fan, but you don't act like it at all. Something was wrong in Crete, right? The place where Titus is working. And Paul addresses that thing that is wrong in this letter. This is what was wrong in Crete. Christians said that they were Christians, but they didn't act like it. They weren't the real deal. Screenshot from the Bible Project's uh, overview poster. We're going to work through it slowly. Because if you get this, you'll understand the teaching text and why it's so difficult for us to work through it. So let's work through the screenshot really, really slowly. There were families in Crete, like any other families. And they acted Cretan, but they said that they were followers of Jesus. And the result was confusion. Okay, so look at it. The present reality was that you had employees not honoring their bosses. You had husband, wife, mom, dad, and kids saying that Jesus is their Lord, but not acting like it at all. Behaving in a way that is not fitting to Christians. And then creating confusion among Cretan people. If you can read up top, it says, Christians, what a joke. Because they say one thing, but they behave differently. And the result was that God's word was being discredited. It was said to be untrue. People were making evil accusations towards Christians. And the Christian message didn't look very compelling. Like, why on earth 
would I burden myself with a religion and a faith and a confession if I can just carry on living the way I want to? That was the problem. Now what Paul wants is he wants Cretan households to do Wopa Jesus style. I just quoted the melody of Gangnam style in case you're wondering about it. And here's the message, and I'm going to read it verbatim. The gospel must prove itself in the public square. Christianity is compelling when it looks culturally similar, but is based on a different value system and devoted to a different God. So you still see husband, wife, mom, dad, and kids, but they look different in their conduct and in their behavior and in their values and in the God they worship. So culturally, they look similar, but in behavior, they look different. So the result was that it, doesn't, it didn't seem like the Christian faith had any implications. It seemed like you can say I'm a Christian and then carry on with your life and that's quite okay. Paul wanted the culture to be transformed. We call this series Transforming Culture because we also believe that in this current time that we are living in, our lives and our behavior and our conduct can actually change this place. It's really exciting. I'm in it. Who's with me? Like, I'm in it for the rest of my life. Let's change this world by being proper job Christians. Now, when we read this teaching text, I'm almost done with the intro, but I said it's going to be a long one. When we read this teaching text, we should pretend as if we just got into a time machine and we traveled 2,000 years into the past and we got out in a world that works in a very different way than our current world. And the reason why I'm saying we should think this way is this text mentions families, it mentions households, but it worked in a very different way than our families and households today. Let me put down some important cultural markers. You would have gotten married between the age of 12 and 15 in this century. You also would have had your first kids between 12 and 15. Because once you got married, the expectation was that you would have kids. And you got married when you became a man, and when a woman became a woman, and then they could conceive a child. That means that in the first century, you could have been a grandpa at 30. Okay? That's really important for us to remember. When I turned 30, Ava, our first child, was three months old. If I lived in the biblical times, Ava's first child would have been three months old. Okay, so it's a very different world. They had multi-generational households, sometimes three and four generations in one house, and everyone had access to one another because everyone saw one another because the houses were really small. Rudolf, do you have the photo of uh, the archaeological excavations in Capernaum? Is it not there? I dropped a photo in there. Um, just to show you how small those houses were. Like this part of the stage, this was a first century house. Here you go. Living room. Bedroom. Little separation wall. Roof up top, about this height, where we could chill and catch some wind. Like that was it. So their houses looked different. And the way that they lived together was different. Because you also learned your trade from grandpa to pa to myself to my son. The first century world had clear gender lines, they had clear gender roles, and it wasn't even about the fact that you must do certain things, it was about the fact that you could only do these things. Like, I'm going to fetch some water at the well, and I'm a man, no you are not, get back in the house. I'm a woman, and I'm going to the marketplace to buy some stuff, you are not, you shall go back into the house. That's how clear these lines were, so it's different in terms of our world. They lived very small and very local lives, and everyone saw you every single day, so there was no way to hide your life. The village where Jesus lived, Capernaum, was between 150 and 350 people. People in Jesus' village very rarely traveled further than 20 kilometers, ever. They only went to Jerusalem and back for Jewish holidays. Marie and I uh, uh, um, went to Caesarea when we were in Israel, and when we stood in Caesarea, our tour guys said to us, do you realize that 99.9% .9 of people that lived in the same town as Jesus never even saw this place? It's only 50 kilometers west, but they would never travel so far, because you have to walk. Like, you can have a boot and a trailer, 
or bus or a plane. It's a donkey. And if you don't have money, you walk with your Jerusalem cruisers. So they lived really small lives. Like if all of us lived on the church grounds, that's Capernaum. And we would see each other every single day. And I can't hide. Like, if this is my house, Soys and Ilana's house starts here. And Soys and Ilana's house goes till here, and then Sanaba and Shiyami's house starts there. So if I shout at my kids, the whole town is going to know. If Marie accuses me of anything, everyone is going to know. If our kids are wild, and I have to bring out the bat, everyone's going to know. That's how they live. We don't even see each other in seven days before we see each other again. And then we only see each other for 90 minutes. Well, sometimes 120. And then we go home. It's a different world. And also, lastly, they actually had idol worship temples, which was open to anyone. And you could go there and worship. Oh, they seem to be worshiping the God of money. Why? Because they are going to the temple of the God of money, taking him offerings, asking him to give them more money. Don't know about you, but when you walk around in mainland, you can also be worshipping money, but we wouldn't know. Because it looks like you're shopping. If you lie on the couch and you watch mindless programs on a streaming service, and you're worshipping celebrity culture, how would we know? Because it looks like you're just watching a movie. But in those days, it was open to everyone. So we have a way of hiding our idols. They are there, but we're hiding it. No one knows what I covet when I browse on my telephone, because it looks so normal. In the first century, like you coveted with your own eyes, looking at the thing. There wasn't the auto trader that could show me what the new fortune looks like. You know what I mean? Like I would have stood next to the new fortune, coveting it right there. You would have seen it. Okay. So the world to which Paul writes are different. Now, I want to show you, and then I'm going to end the intro. Who does he talk to? Two slides. What should they do? Two slides. And why should they do this? Also two slides. So let me just show you quickly. Bold and underline, first one. He's talking to you, that's Titus, the leader of the church. Second one, older men. I'll tell you who they are. Older women. Young women. Next slide. He's also talking, please, Rudolf, sorry, next slide, please. He's also talking to young men. Then he's talking to Titus again, yourself. Then he's talking to Titus again, yourself or your, and then he's talking to slaves. Okay, so that's who he's talking to. Now, just a note, I'll get there later. We're not talking about the wretched slave trade of buying people and abusing them and using them as if they were possessions. What Paul is talking about here is someone submitting to someone else for work, which I think a good translation for today is employee. Okay, next slide, please. This is what they have to do. It's quite a lot. Do you agree with me? Like, just look at the bold and underlines. There's a big to-do list here. Next slide, please, Rudolf. It continues, full of bolds and underlines. Okay, so who he's talking to? I just showed you. I just showed you everything they have to do. Let me show you why they have to do this. There are three clauses in this portion of Scripture. The next two slides, please, Rudolf, with so that. Look at it. Why all of this to all of these people? So that God's word will not be slandered. We'll get back to it. Second one, please, Rudolf. So that any opponent will be ashamed. Third one. So that they may adorn the teaching of God our Savior in everything. How's that for an intro? Let me give you a summary. Here's a summary. Titus 2, verse 1 to 10. Next slide, please, Rudolf. Is about people given instructions for very good reasons. Hey, that's concise and clear. And living in grace, which is our theme for today, and here's our two points for the sermon, means living a life of devotion to God, a life of godliness, and being a witness to the gospel. How do we live in response to God's grace? Now let's work through it slowly. One long point 
one short one, and we'll be done. Okay, let's go for it. So to Titus first, Rudolf, if I can have uh, just verse 1 up again, please. He says, Titus, please teach the gospel of grace, like the teaching, the message. That's what you ought to teach. So that's a really, really important guideline. That's also what we have to teach. Now, what's the summary of the gospel or the sound teaching? It is that we are unique in the sense that we are Christians, that we are the only religion that can sit under the verb done and not under the verb do. Think about it. If we have to arrange religions, we would have a massive group of do religions. I'm not saying anything bad to them, but that is what you do. So to please God, you have to do stuff. And then there's one religion on this side that says you don't have to do anything. It's about what was done for you. And there's only one, and that's Christianity. So the fundamental uniqueness of Christianity lies in the fact that it's a religion of grace and not of works. Now Paul says, that is what you teach. Everything else added on to Christianity is a lie. And lie is a, theme, is a theme through the whole letter. Do you guys remember Lesechel's intro? Saying that the very name Cretan means liar. And that's why Paul says, stick to the core message. Parents, you who baptize your kids today, this is what you should teach to them. This is what Christ has done for you and for us. That's the core message. Leaders of this church, this is what we should teach people. And then how that applies should be consistent with that teaching. It should correspond with that teaching. It should be in accord with that teaching. It should come from that teaching. Think about the Titans metaphor again. If I am a Titans fan, then I go and watch the game. Because that is what a fan does. And when I am at the game and they hit a... Six over the duck pond end, then I get onto my feet and I cheer because my behavior is consistent with that of a fan. That is what we should teach. Now, why would Paul say this? Because two really common misconceptions in those days were that if I receive God's grace, I've got license to sin because he's going to forgive me anyway. I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter because he's forgiven me for everything. That is a lie. We don't have a license to sin. But then another misconception on this side was that I am now burdened with all these rules and regulations and things that I have to do. It's too heavy to carry for me. That's also not true of the gospel. What is true of the gospel is that I make a choice to be part of something, and I commit to it, and then I deem it a privilege that I get to do this. My response should show that I value this. My marriage is a really good example. I chose to marry Marie. I want to be in this marriage. But when I get up in the morning, I don't say, oh my word, I have to kiss her again. And I have to hug her again. And I have to make her coffee again. No, no, no. <laughs> Fam, let me tell you. I get up and I look at her and I go, I get to kiss her. And I get to serve her. And I get to raise kids with her. It's a privilege. It asks everything of me, but my posture should be a value, a, a response that shows that I value this. And that's what Paul gets into. So as he speaks to all of these groups of people, this is what he's asking for, is how do you respond to this beautiful grace that has been shown to you. Let's take the categories. Older men. Now, <laughs> this is a difficult one, because in the scriptures, the older men would have been grandpas or great-grandpas already. Okay? So if Paul is writing to a 60-plusser, yeah, he's talking to someone who's already a great-granddad, if you think of the 15-year gaps in which people got kids. Okay? If you're 60 in these days, there's a chance that you're not even a grandpa yet. Okay? And obviously, I mean, it's also possible that you don't even have your own kids. Now, what Paul says, I'm summarizing, but look at the scripture behind me and all the bold and underlines. We need a flesh and bone example of what this life looks like so that we can follow it. Look at it. A life of self-control, worthy of respect, sensible, in sound faith, love, and endurance. We need to see a human being 
like us, to set us an example of what this looks like so that we can follow this example. I know that Jesus is our supreme example, obviously. I know that Jesus reveals himself to us in the pages of Scripture. I know that Jesus can fill the gaps where we have them in our lives. But if that was true of the church, then Paul would have said, we don't need older men. We don't need older women. You just follow Jesus and you'll be fine. But he didn't. He said, older men, this is what I need from you, so that people younger than you can see how it's done. What's our biggest problem in South Africa at the moment? Is we don't have older men that can show us the way. We struggle with fatherhood, my age in South Africa, because we don't have a lot of examples in the uh, uh, prior generations to show us what it looks like. But older men actually have a very important role to play here. They are supposed to show us what it looks like to trust in God. They're supposed to show us what it looks like to serve. They're supposed to show us what it looks like to keep going faithfully until the end. Old men are supposed to show us how you persevere through the hard times of life. Because they've been there before. They have seen this movie, talking Pretoria vernacular. Paul says, for older men in the church, this is the example that you should set. We need this as a church here. This is something that we should pray for in our church. We are a very young church in, ch in terms of our age spread. We need older men who can live this life. Look at verse 3. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women. And then we get to young women. The language that Paul uses here is temper language. So Anna, in the Gospel of Luke, is also described as a reverent woman. Someone who has given her life to the worship of God. How did they know that about Anna? She lived in the temple. And now Paul says, in the same way that everyone knew that that lady was uh, living a life of praise to God, in that same way, older women, people should see it. You should be reverent in your behavior. It talks about a holiness. It talks about living set aside. It talks about an inner purity. And it also talks about having no doubt about this. So, is she or is she not? That's not where you want to be. Paul says, for older women, you should know. Proverbs 31 verse 30 says, listen to this, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord will be praised. That's really, really important. So for the same reason as older men, he gives these uh, instructions to older women. Because we need real life examples. And then look how he adds two very specific pointers to the older women. And it has to do with how they speak. Look at it. You should not slander. You should rather teach. And the point is control. That's why drinking excessively is in the middle of those two. Dragging someone's name through the mud is slandering. Talking bad about someone. And when you drink, you can't stop it. When you drink, it happens. Because you lose control of your tongue. And you lose control of your emotions. So if you drink and slander people, you won't be able to teach them the good stuff. You'll be teaching them evil stuff. The word slander means evil. Do not speak evil. Don't drink and lose control of yourself, but teach what is good to the younger women in the church. This word good is fascinating. Look at it. He says um, that they, may, uh, they are to teach what is good. This word good appears in the New Testament only once. Crazy. Only in this place. So what they are supposed to teach the younger women is a on-the-job syllabus. It's teaching young women as you go. It's teaching young women in the context of everyday life. 
It's not teaching young women like for Titus in verse 1. Teach them the doctrine. Like this is what you teach them. This body of information has to go into their heads and into their hearts. That's your job, Titus. Now he says to the older women, your job is to teach the younger women good. But not a body of content. Rather, how you live everyday life. To be available to them. To mentor them. And to show them the way. It's fascinating, huh? Now, some cultures in our country do that really well when it comes to how to cook food and how to clean a house. But unfortunately, no culture in South Africa will teach you how to be a Christian well. See, that's the problem. So we get all this cultural input, and I really know how to be a great white Afrikaans person. But the white Afrikaans culture is not the culture that will teach me how to be a good Christian. That's why we are a transcultural church. The gospel transcends all of our human and man-made boundaries. Okay, then he talks to young women. Now, he says the young women should be encouraged, listen to this, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, in submission to their husbands, so that God's word will not be slandered. That's quite a list. Let's be honest. And the younger woman he's talking about here is people like my wife, Marie. So we married already, but we're not grandparents yet. But we do have kids because he spoke about your, uh, uh, your husband and your children. The love that he's talking about here is an other-centered love. It is a sacrificial love. It is a covenantal love. And it is a hard love. The warm and fuzzies and the erotic love of I find you attractive and you find me attractive. That's the easy part of love in a marriage. The hard part is choosing for the other every single day. That's the hardest part of loving your kids. They will not give you anything back, but you will sacrifice everything for them. Parents in the house, I feel you. I feel you. This is a hard love. I did a, uh, I did a wedding on Friday. Well, I do a lot of weddings, but I did a wedding on Friday. And I looked at that couple as they kissed one another. And I'm like, you are going to fight the second day on your honeymoon. And it's going to be really hard. Not because there's something wrong with them, but everyone fights on their honeymoon. And then you, you look at your wife and you go, where, where, where is all the woman fuzzies? It's like it's day two. Is it all gone? It's the same with kids. You go home with your baby, and everyone is so excited, and then the baby starts crying. Hello, excitement over. <laughs> Milk, diaper, umbilical cord, burps, sleep, repeat. <laughs> it only lasts for a couple of hours, the trip home, and then it gets really, really hard. And the reason why Paul says that young women has to be encouraged is because they have the double whammy. They have to love the husband and the kids. Ladies, I feel you. I'm not easy to love. And our kids are also not easy to love. And I don't think any husband in the house can say, well, I'm really easy to love. It's not easy to love. The dailies can be really hard. Submitting to your husband when he takes leadership in your marriage is hard. Following your husband as he follows Jesus and trusting that he's following Jesus is hard. And that's why you need encouragement. Why? Because marriage is a gift. And children are a gift. Everything we have belongs to God. And we should steward it accordingly. So if you're married, God gave your spouse to you. If you've got kids, God gave your kid to you. It doesn't matter the circumstances in which they came. And they're not yours. They're His. So we should steward it accordingly. That's why we need encouragement. Paul is straight. He says if you don't love your husband and your kids, and you don't live in this way, and, that you, and you're not encouraged to do it, then God's word will be slandered. What does that mean? People will say the gospel isn't true. Because husband and wife promise that they will love one another in light of the fact that God loves them. So now they're not loving one another. So now God is not loving them. This whole religion is false. That's what Paul doesn't want. Paul wants our lives to give confirmation 
to this, um, uh, the, this faith we hold and this truth that we believe. Young woman, culture will not help you to do this. Your older sisters will. This is really important. If you pitch at your Monday meeting tomorrow and your team leader asks you, what do you want to achieve this week? And you say, I would really love to learn how to love my husband well. And I feel like I need to learn something about sacrificing for the kids this week. I want to go above and beyond for them. Your team leader will look at you and ask you to leave the meeting. Because I want results, dude. Like, I was, I was referring to your to-do lists at work. How are we going to make profits? Like, how are we going to get this thing done? I don't really care about your personal life. I'm not saying all workspaces are like that, but many workspaces are like that. The culture won't help you. This community will. And we are a community. We do this together. This should be the place where we can ask, listen, learn, fail, and try again. So young woman, I want you to read through these, and I want you to listen to the Spirit. While you do that, I'm going to talk to the gents. Gentlemen, we are up next. And you'll see that we've got a really simple line, and it's very short. And you might chuckle and go, thanks, Paul, for giving the women more work than we have. But I want you to know that everything in this verse is not only on your wife's to-do list. It's also on yours. That's why parents come in too. Get in there and help. When it comes to working in the home and being kind, what Marie and I say to each other is, someone has to do it. So who's it going to be today? It's as easy as that. So I wash dishes, I do laundry, I bath the kids, I get them ready for bed. But I also do fill up the cars with diesel and I make sure that they're serviced. I also sort out the garden that needs to be sorted out, etc., etc. But there are some things that we do together. So I do laundry and she does laundry. I do dishes and she does dishes. I wash, bath the kids and she bath the kids. The question is just who's going to do it today? This is important for us. If you're two parents, one parent can't run everything. We should help. Okay, let's look at the next slide quickly. Gents, yours is easy, but it's difficult. Encourage young men to be self-controlled. That's it. So older men also had self-control, do you remember? Younger men, one thing on the list, self-control. Why so short, but why so powerful? Because if you lose it here, you will lose it everywhere. Urge them to control themselves. It's mission critical. You can't be a dad if you can't control yourself. You can't be a husband if you can't control yourself. You can't be a leader if you can't control yourself. So the moment you lose control, it's a slippery slope or a downward spiral. And you will lose control over everything. Control yourself. You won't be able to discipline your kids if you lose it with them the whole time. You will be selfish if you can't control your own needs. You won't ever serve, because who would choose that out of their own? That's why alcohol is an issue in our country. We still rank in the top 10 heaviest drinking countries in the world. What happens when you drink? You lose control, and then you hurt, period. Control your greed. Because what happens if you uh, submit to greed is you make dodgy decisions that puts your life and the life of your wife and kids at risk because you covet money. Don't do it. Control yourself. That's what he says. Gender-based violence is an epidemic in our country. Its root is the loss of self-control. Christian men can change that. Christian men can live in the opposite way and stop this tide that's burying our culture. Controlling yourself doesn't come when you get up in the morning and you stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself in the eye and you give yourself a chest bump and you say, today I'm going to control myself. That's not how it works. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, gentlemen. It is given to you. Live into it. How did I learn to walk? I can't remember the day. But someone gave it to me. Someone learned me the skill. Taught me the skill. And now I can walk. So how do you control yourself? 
The Spirit gives it to you. So you rely on the Spirit to control yourself in times where it seems like you are losing control. Then he says to Titus, you yourself should be an example of this. Your message should be sound so that any opponent will be ashamed. In short, people in Crete were saying that there's no purpose in this religion. There's really nothing to it. What a joke. He says he is, but he is not. What's our biggest criticism in the church? From the world outside, through the ages, and in this time. Hypocrites! You say one thing, but you live a different way. Self-control, brothers and sisters, is where it all starts, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. Let me say something about slaves, and then we'll be done. Slaves, in this sense, is employees. So not talking about the wretched slave trade that we've seen across the world, not talking about the abuse of people here. What we're talking about here is apprentices, administrators, members of households, someone who takes orders from someone else. So if you're not the boss today of whatever it is you're busy with, then you're a slave in this sense. Now Paul says, if you're a slave, then work in this way. Submitting to your masters. Obviously it's not unbiblical and unethical, but submitting to your masters. Being productive. Doing what you're supposed to do. Not being the rabble rouser at the water cooler but getting your work done, not stealing, and demonstrating faithfulness. Why? Because if people see this, they will believe the gospel. I'll get to that now. So look at that, read it, reflect on it, and then let me just ask you a question. If I go to your place of work tomorrow, and I ask your colleagues, how is she? Is that what they would say? Because that's what Paul wants. Paul wants this life in the workplace as well. People should say this person works as if they are working for Jesus. That's Colossians 3.23. Not as if they are working for an earthly boss. So living in grace means living a life of devotion to God. Massive first point. Are you with me? Can we do one quick one? Second point. Living in grace means being a witness to the gospel. It's an easy one. Listen to it. Point one was all about living a life to please God. Point two is about living a life to persuade others. Do you see the two Ps? So we want to please God, but we also want to persuade others. What is a witness? A witness is someone who can give an account of what happened. What's a good witness? A good witness is the person with the truest version of the events. So you see a car accident, and people witness about what happened. Whose witness wins? The person who's got the best version of the events that's there. Then we believe what that person says. That's what Paul asks for. Let your life be a witness, so that 